So this is this is definitely not a not a top ten list. I just want to make sure that's really clear. There's there's probably a whole bunch of more things that that I could put together if I wanted to try and have a complete. This is how to have the, the perfect career. Um, I'm not quite at that point of having the perfect career or, or arrogance, I don't know. Um, so this is just kind of 10 things that I think are, are kind of cool things to have. So your mileage is going to vary, just to kind of throw it out there, which obviously nullifies any negative comments, which is great. <laughs> so who here really, really enjoys their job? Like fundamentally enjoys their job? So it's not a, not a trick question. So the fact that more than like 10% of the hands go up kind of proves my theory that this is really not the real world we live in. <laughs> the, the fact that we're not hating our jobs, um, which is weird because I always thought the people that would hate their jobs would be like accountants because of how boring it is. Um, even though we only get to kind of play with two numbers, one and zero, and they get like all of them. Um, it's a bit of an accounting joke. So, um, so yeah. So. Like I said, this is a, a 10 things that I think are kind of cool things to have in a, in a mindset. So the first thing that I think is really important is this concept of, of having a beginner's mind. Uh, and you're probably thinking that you work with a lot of people that have a beginner's mind, uh, but that's not really the, the connotation I'm going for. It's, it's more this idea of, of being able to go into a... a um, into a concept with a, a, clear, a clear mind and having no preconceptions and trying to kind of zero out all of your, your, your previous knowledge to go in and, and really kind of learn from the ground up. Even if it's a topic that you understand already uh, or it's an advanced topic and, and it's, it's obvious that you have to have some previous understanding, being able to go in there and, and have this beginner's mind I think is really important. And it's a, it's a really difficult thing to do because often we want to uh, you know, have a way of kind of showboating and say, oh, but I've done this before and I've done something similar. But being able to actually pull that back and, and just go in with this clear mind, I think, is, is a really useful uh, concept. And it's one of these really useful concepts that's really difficult to do, uh, which is why it's, it's part of this, um, it's one of the, one of the Zen concepts. Um, but it's a, it's, a really, it's a really interesting idea. And there's, there's books on it, as you can imagine. There's books on anything. Um, but they all just talk around this idea of going in uh, without a, a need to try and master something, but to go in and actually learn and, and improve and, and kind of do the and do the kind of do the steps to learn something, uh, which I think is really cool. So for me, one of the the, the three worst words that a, a junior programmer can can know is file new project. Uh, for me, that's the the worst way to learn something because it's the easiest way to actually get into a, a piece of technology is to start a brand new project. And the problem is most of the projects that I've been involved in haven't enabled me to just start from scratch as much as you want to. And as much as my previous life as a consultant, as much as you, you advise the client that you have to rewrite everything, um, it's actually not necessarily the best way to go. And it's also it's a much more difficult entry into computer science to actually you know, join a project that's already running with concepts that are already in place and having to actually understand that. And I think the only way you can do that is to go in and just kind of accept what's there and, and learn with this, this mind that's just open to actually, you know, learn the concepts that are already in place. Um, so definitely learning something new and having that, that beginner's mind is really important. Uh, earlier in my career, I always believed that a company's primary role besides paying my salary on time was to kind of roll out the red carpet in terms of career guidance. Um, and kind of eventually I realized that that's not really their primary objective, is me and my career. Uh, and it's definitely something that, that Netflix talks about, that your career and your, your path in, in your career is kind of your business, and the company's got their own business. And if the two can you know, coincide for a period of time, that's great. Uh, but it's not for the company to kind of bend over backwards to try and provide you with the best career. Um, and once I kind of started realizing that, it, it was a bit of an eye-opener. Um, and it's great, obviously, if the company can provide some kind of career guidance. But I think it's also a little bit, a little bit unrealistic to kind of have that, have that mindset, at least in my, in my kind of view. Um, and I was speaking to someone that runs a consulting company, and, and their belief is that 
uh, senior developers are kind of set in their ways, and it's much easier to train more junior developers. Uh, and I, I can understand his point of view, and I think that comes in with this idea of, of whether the senior, the senior person can come in with a mind that's, that's open and willing to learn, which is what this, this beginner's mind is all about. So the next one that's really important is this idea of not, not working for ourselves um, or with. You can kind of go with, go with either option. So there's, there's actually a book that kind of covers us specifically. Um, and, and their definition is someone that, that kind of makes you feel worse after you interact with them than you were before. So that's kind of their definition of what, a, what an arsehole is. Um, and it's, it's something that's, that we all have to deal with. You're not going to kind of get away from, from dealing with people that are, that are a bit toxic. Um, so this is not necessarily saying, you know, quit your job if you've got a, a boss that's, that's a little bit toxic. Uh, but maybe just kind of understanding their thought process and kind of trying to work around that as much as you can. Uh, but it's not always, a, not always something that you can get right. Trying to kind of fix someone else is, is not really a skill that I've, that I've necessarily mastered. Um, so it's just kind of something to be aware of. But this is very different to working with someone that you don't like. Uh, and I think that's a, a skill that you have to have. Necessarily putting up with someone that's, that, that is the definition um, is something that's, that you, you know, potentially don't have to deal with in your life. Um, so I think that's pretty important. And this kind of centers around one of these, these concepts from, uh, from someone called Dr. Deming who was a, um, an econ economist and a statistician and one of the people that was credited with turning Japan around after the Second World War in terms of their industry. And he's got a, a bunch of points that's, that's for management. And I like the way he phrases it, that it's for management, not for like, the people underneath them. And one of, their, one of his points is this idea of driving fear out of an organization. And it sounds so simple, because why should people be afraid at, at work? But it's actually such an ingrained thing in so many companies where people are afraid of asking questions or afraid of putting up their hand or afraid of saying they don't understand something. And it comes down to this idea of a, a toxic working environment. Um, and it's certainly something I've been guilty of before, and I'm, I'm sure we all have, um, or maybe not. <laughs> um, so kind of having this idea of, of driving fear out of an organization is really important. And it goes hand in hand with these sort of toxic bosses as well. Uh, and it was actually like a part two to the book. You can imagine how popular it was if there's actually a follow-up several years later. The survival guide. And kind of hand in hand with that previous one is, is kind of don't be that person. So it's, it's also really important to kind of just, just kind of keep in mind that you've got to, you know, be a team player. Um, and often it's, it's difficult if there's kind of stuff going on or you've got your own uh, kind of objectives that might not necessarily gel with the team. Um, but it's definitely important to kind of just, just bear in mind. So you might be that person that, that's causing other people to read that book to kind of handle you, which is not a great thing. Not me, obviously. This is a hypothetical me. Um, so certainly initially, earlier on in my career, I used to kind of move between companies, which I'm sure we all used to. Um, and now it's kind of in vogue again, where you can kind of work for a couple of months and call yourself a contractor or whatever it is. Um, and I always used to think it's unbelievable how many, like, idiots there are in the industry. And I had this kind of mindset that everyone was really bad. And I think at some point you kind of realize, well, hang on, maybe, maybe it's not everyone else. You know, maybe it's kind of things that I'm bringing to the table that aren't, that aren't perfect. Um, but you know, you kind of, kind of work that out of your system as much as you can, I guess. So the next one is having a, having a good story to tell. Now, obviously, this is kind of part and parcel with, um, you know, with a whole bunch of other things. So you've got to make sure that you've you know, you're doing good work to have a good story to tell. But the, the one thing that's the worst for me in a, in a setting like this is you, you chat with somebody new and you, you ask what they do. And invariably what they tell you is they're a Ruby programmer, which, which is great. There's nothing wrong with being a Ruby programmer. But it just kind of makes them kind of one of everyone else. There's no kind of uniqueness involved. So I think having a, a good personal elevator pitch is a really useful, useful thing. You don't have to be trying to pitch to kind of sell something. But just to kind of position yourself in a, in a unique way, I think, is, is pretty useful. And it's, it's not easy for, for us who've chosen to work with computers as opposed to other human beings. But um, 
I think it's a, it's a useful skill for sure. Um, so the next one is having uh, an ability to do the simple things over and over. And I think so often we, we strive for the, the next big thing, so the next uh, Ruby framework or the next JavaScript framework, which is even worse. Um, but often the, the things that, that are kind of the building blocks of having a, a good career and a, and a good life in, in work is, are things like showing up. And it's not just showing up like, like pitching up at work, which is, I guess, like a minimum requirement, but it's, it's pitching up and actually being part of a team and, and doing your part. Um, and it sounds really boring because it's, it's not these kind of cool, these cool things, um, but often it's just being there and just kind of being supportive of everyone else and doing your part is, is kind of doing, doing a whole lot. Um, and it sounds really boring, but it's, I think it's really true. Um, another one around this, this idea of doing the simple things is deliberate practice. So how many of us actually practice the, the craft that we actually sell to people? Besides actually just kind of selling, selling the thing. So you can imagine like a, a musician. Uh, I'm, I doubt that most musicians are going to just kind of jump up on stage and perform. Uh, I'm going to guess that that's like 1% of, of what they do in terms of the instrument and, and the art that they're doing. Uh, but often for, for us, we don't really do enough deliberate practice. And a lot of the, the work that we do is actually kind of time on the job as opposed to this idea of deliberate practice. Um, and I know it's difficult, you know, family and, and all these other things that we do, but, but having time to actually practice the, the art that, that we do, whether you want to call it an art or, or whatever, uh, is, is pretty useful. Um, and getting the basics right is really important. So Jack Ma's got a, um, obviously got a whole bunch of talks of his on, on the web, but one of the things that he talks about is when you're in, in your 20s, you should uh, follow a good boss and you should just learn to do uh, join a good company and learn to do the things properly. Uh, and I think it's such a nice, such a really simpl simplistic way of putting it, but it's, it's a really good way to actually kind of get the point across. So it's just kind of putting in those, that time, putting in the effort and, and doing those simple things over and over to kind of get that ingrained in, in how you do your work. So I came across this, uh, this quote, which I thought was pretty, uh, pretty fitting. And the worst thing for me is when I find a, a useful quote or a, uh, an interesting book is when you figure out that it was actually 100 years ago that this was, this was said, um, which kind of, kind of hurts because you kind of wish that maybe you'd read it a while ago. Um, but anyway, um, so this is, you know, you can kind of argue the validity now if it's so many years ago, um, but I think this is really interesting. So only... 15% actually comes down to technical knowledge, and the rest is these, uh, these kind of soft skills that often we're not taught formally, and we have to kind of learn the hard way. So the next one is being able to explain something properly to a, to a human being as opposed to somebody in, in our industry. Um, and I, what I see so often is, is people being unable to actually deconstruct what's in their mind and actually lay it, lay it out in a, in a simple way without being condescending. Um, now, I'm not going to be the, the white guy talking about inclusivity, but I, I think it often comes down to the fact when you see one person talking to another, uh, it can come across as so condescending the way that, that somebody says something, or they can position it in a way that's so difficult to understand, you're almost excluding the person that you're trying to explain it to by kind of making it seem like it's such a complex topic. So being able to actually explain something in, in actual English um, and actually deconstruct the, the difficult things into a whole bunch of simple things, uh, for me is a really interesting skill that so, many, so few people actually have. Because at the end of the day, I think what we do is actually really simple. It just comes down to how many kind of simple things are running concurrently that makes it seem like it's really complex. But if you think about it, it's actually, it's actually pretty simple what we do. So being able to deconstruct that is... Um, it's quite an important thing. So the next one, which took me a, took me a long time to, to get to, and it's certainly something that I've, I've, I haven't exactly mastered at the moment, is defending your sleep. So I think it's too easy to, to get into a mindset of, of being a workaholic 
and kind of putting in the hours and, and kind of viewing it as some kind of a permanent death march, but actually defending this idea that you've got to still have good sleep, um, good quality and, and amount of time is, is such an important thing that just gets overlooked. And it can also get kind of twisted against you um, and you could be viewed as maybe a clock watcher because you don't want to work you know, 10, 12, 15 hours a day. Um, but I think over the long term, I think it's a much healthier approach to you know, work a sustainable amount of time and a sustainable pace and to make sure that you're actually having that, that kind of personal time to, to regenerate. And it's, it's a lot of people that have been speaking about it. Uh, the new Basecamp book, I don't know who, who's read it, so it doesn't have to be crazy at work. Uh, that's a really interesting read. And it repeats a lot of the stuff that you've seen on, on Twitter and, and on, on their blogs and things like that, but it's interesting to have it in one place. Um, so for those that haven't read it, I really would recommend reading it. I think it's, um, it's, a good, it's a good read. And one of the things they talk about is around you know, eight hours a day and 40 hours a week, and, and viewing that as being sufficient. So not viewing that as being some kind of uh, like employment contract minimum, and you know, you're just going to do the minimum, or you're actually going to like, do, do as much as everyone else but viewing it as being enough time to actually get the work done and, and focus and actually get it all, get it all done. Um, and it's also something that Joel Spolsky spoke about a long time ago, he was the Fog Creek guy and, and Stack Overflow, about how if you constrain your day and you say, I'm only gonna work eight hours, you tend to get as much done as someone that's gonna just stay on and just work extra hours because you've given the self, yourself this artificial deadline. Um, so you don't just get this ever-expanding amount of time. You've actually got a set amount of time that you can get things done. Um, and I certainly have found it to be a lot easier on your kind of psyche and your, and your health to try and stick to an actual time. Uh, and it gets, and I, like I said, if it gets kind of misconstrued as being a clock watcher, uh, if you think about it, everything's around watching a clock. You know, we're going to watch a clock to see when the conference is going to start and when it's going to be time for for beers, and when your salary is going to get paid, and when you've got to pay your accounts. It all comes down to, you know, some kind of calendar-driven thing, which is just how it is. Um, so who's got two years of Slack in their teams? So I know when Slack came out, they were saying how, how much better it's going to be because there's no more email, and it's Slack so much easier, and your life's going to be so much better. Um, who kind of has this, this like, um, like post-traumatic stress disorder that's, that's coming up whenever your kind of slack alerts kick in. Yeah, I'm sure I'm not the only one. And you can't like switch it off because you know that you've been that person to kind of switch off you know, any indication that there's a fire back in the office. So I don't know, if anyone can kind of figure out <laughs> how to get that balance, uh, you'll let me know, please. Um, and I think it's, it's also just so important, and this kind of comes into the next slide, is you know, to understand how, how fleeting the moments are and how fleeting kind of life is and, and things like that. Um, and you don't kind of realize it beforehand. You realize it kind of after things have happened that kind of make you aware of it. So for me, work isn't life, but it's, it enables you to kind of have some kind of life as well. And that doesn't mean you're not committed to work. Uh, I think there's a very clear distinction between those two concepts. But... But again, having that kind of mindset that there is life after work is, is pretty important. And also not deferring things until you retire, because um, that's potentially kind of a ways off, unless those of you that are sitting on, on shares for a company that's going to send out these rainbows and have a big vesting party. So the next one for me, which kind of comes into the previous slide, is this idea of there being life outside of work. So not after work, but this is kind of outside of outside of the day. And I always, I, I kind of follow a bunch of um, people on Instagram, I guess that's, that's kind of what you're meant to do, to kind of have these artificial friends. Um, and a lot of them are around, which is kind of bad, is around these kind of desktop setups. These people that spend like gazillion dollars on all these monitors and things like that, which you can't have, but you can kind of vicariously have it by following them on Instagram. Um, or having it as your desktop picture, which is going to be a bit weird. So at one point, I had a desktop picture of what was behind my monitor just to kind of piss off a coworker, But I, I don't think they kind of registered what was going on, so I just kind of gave up. It was quite funny. The only issue is you couldn't actually have anything on your screen, so I, I didn't really do much work that morning. So I don't know if that kind of backfired, but it's quite funny if you've got kind of my sense of humor. 
So these pictures are great. And they've got this kind of great, you know, this, this kind of field of roaming wildebeest or something in the background. And then they're going to put up a whole bunch of monitors to kind of block the view. Um, so I kind of see the irony. And you often see people on holiday and they've got their feet up and on the beach and they've got like the laptop, um, which to me kind of defeats the whole purpose. So I'm, I'm seeing the irony a bit more. Um, and, uh, you know, they speak a lot around this idea of fear of missing out. And for me, that's kind of turning into this idea of the joy of missing out, where it's actually okay not to, like, be at work and, and do work things. You can kind of have a bit of your own time as well. Um, and one of my, my favorite books is actually coming up for its 300th um, anniversary, the publishing date, which is Robinson Crusoe, which I'm sure we've all read. Has everyone kind of read or understand the story of Robinson Crusoe? Um, so if you get one of the older copies, which, which has the older English and actually has kind of the full story, it's actually quite mind-blowing because it's so different to the, the abridged version, the kind of kid's version. Um, and I'm not going to ruin it, but I, I am going to ruin it because no one actually reads. So it's not like you're going to run out and go get a 300-year-old copy of Robinson Crusoe. So here's this, this guy that was kind of marooned on an island for, for years and years and years and eventually kind of made his way back to Europe. And and got so pissed off because it was so terrible and there were so many people and he kind of hated being there that he actually kind of made his way back to the island. That's actually the full circle of the story, um, which is kind of mind-blowing. This is 300 years ago, and I know it's not necessarily based on fact. It's kind of bits and pieces that are factual. But you can imagine somebody writing 300 years ago about this concept of how bad it would be to be around people in Europe that you've got to go, like, hide onto some remote island. I thought that was quite funny. I thought this is only like a modern day issue that we had. Apparently not. Um, and Arnold Schwarzenegger's got a, a great video online which he talks about his, um, uh, the, all his kind of work and effort that he put into to getting to where he is um, as, a, as an actor. If I can air quote that, we can always edit that out. Um, and as, as a Mr. Universe. And the one thing he talks about is how he never wasted a single minute. And you can misconstrue that as kind of workaholic, and, and that's fine. Uh, but for me, it's really important to understand the value of these kind of fleeting times that we've got. So to not waste it. So the next one is, is embracing this idea of the 10-year challenge. So I didn't do the 10-year challenge. I don't know if anyone else did. Uh, I got a lot less hair, hair than I did 10 years ago. My mother's actually got it. It's in a cupboard. It's about so long. Um, it was longer than, than Kenneth's. So the one thing that, one of the things that I fear, I fear a whole bunch of things, um, but I mean nothing too weird, is this idea of in 10 years time to kind of be in the same place um, as a, you know, personally and professionally, that's, that's one of the things I really hate. Uh, so it's, it's something that I try and defend against. Change, is, change for the sake of change is not the point, but, but being, having evolved as a person and professionally evolving is really important. And I'm sure a lot of you have got people that you meet who year after year, it's the same thing. It's the same person in the same role, doing the same thing, complaining about the same thing. Um, so that's definitely something that I'm, I'm anti. So, you know, learning from others is a really important thing. Um, you need to kind of bear in mind that their advice is, is something that necessarily worked for them, but it's not necessarily going to work for you. It's like asking somebody for their winning lotto numbers that they won a whole bunch of money on or with. It's not necessarily going to work for you. So it's the same idea. Um, and trying to copy from companies is also not a great idea. There was a, a conversation on Slack uh, on Twitter that was started by Kent Beck. And I thought the, the comment by the chap at the bottom was very clever. So you can copy whatever you want, but you can't necessarily paste it into your organization. Just going that computer science metaphor. I thought it was funny. Uh, so this is my last slide for those that are itching for, for coffee or something. Um, I think it's really important to contribute. And uh, I don't view our industry as a, as a zero-sum game. I think just because one person benefits doesn't mean that there has to be a, a loser or somebody that's, that's lost something as a result. So contributing at a conference or contributing at a user group or contributing in a way that you can just help somebody else level up in, in their career or on a project is, is a really important thing. And you don't have to kind of grandstand it and tell everyone about it and blog about it, you can kind of do it quietly. That's maybe the best way to do it. Um, but for me, I think that's, that's really important. Uh, just making sure that you're able to contribute. Um, so yeah, so that's me.
Thank you very much. Thank you.